Okay, uh, morning everyone. So I'm Rocky Duan uh, from Berkeley AI Research Lab, where I do research on reinforcement learning, um, meta learning, and robotics. So I will now be presenting about the second lecture on sampling based approximations to the algorithms we have just seen in the first lecture, and also function fitting methods. So as a quick recap of what we just seen in the first lecture, we have looked at the problem setup of optimal control, where we are given a Markov decision process, which consists of a state space S, an action space A, a transition function P, a reward function R, a discount gamma, and also a horizon H. So here, gamma is a real number between zero and one, and H can either be finite or infinite. And the goal is to find the optimal policy pi star which maximizes the expected sum of our rewards, uh, the discounted rewards. And we have seen exact methods for solving this optimal policy, including value iteration and policy iteration. So both of those are iterative methods, which apply some formula um, to our current estimate of either the state values or the current policy, and to improve them. And they are both guaranteed to converge to the desired value that we want. So, those methods are applicable when we have access to the underlying dynamics of the environment. And there's also another underlying assumption, which is that the total number of states and actions cannot be too large, so that we can store all the Q values or the entire policy into a table, which we can conveniently look up when we want to execute the policy. And so that prevents such methods from really being applicable and or to qualify them really as RL algorithms, in the sense that if you look at an RL agent, all the access or the entire interface it should have is to interact with the environment without requiring any more access. So in this lecture, we're going to move beyond those limitations. And to move beyond the first limitation of access to the dynamics, we'll look at sampling-based approximations for each of the algorithms we have seen in the first lecture. And to move beyond the second limitation, we'll be looking at function fitting methods. So let's get started with sampling-based approximation. And here I have listed all the algorithms we have just covered, but in a slightly shuffled order. And first, we'll look at Q-value iteration. And just as a very quick recap, we have defined the optimal Q-value of a state S and an action A to be the expected utility, which is simply the discounted sum of rewards. When we start in a certain state S, and first we take the action A as specified, and thereafter, we will act optimally according to some optimal policy. And we have seen that this optimal Q-value satisfies a certain Bellman equation, which relates the optimal Q-value at a certain state and a certain action with the optimal Q-value at other states and other actions. And together, this Bellman equation uniquely defines a solution Q-star, which we will try to find. And we have seen that Q-value iteration is an iterative method for solving Q-star, it is very simple, where we will start with some initial estimate of the Q values, so we can just initialize them all to zero. And within each iteration, we will replace Q star on the right-hand side of the Bellman, oops, sorry. We'll replace Q star here by the current estimate of the Q values, QK, and we'll compute this right-hand side, which will be our next iterate of the Q values. And so I have it here on the top of the slide. And so the issue of access in the dynamics, what I meant by that is that here, we're both enumerating over all future states which are reachable from the current state, and also we're computing the exact probability of reaching that future state. So this is actually very luxurious in the sense that consider if you're saying in reality controlling a robot. What this means is that after you take some action, you need to know both what are all the possible future states you can reach and you also need to compute the exact, exact probability of reaching each of those states. And instead, what we're going to look for is a much weaker form of interaction. Instead of trying to enumerate and also to compute the exact probability, what we're going to do is only to require ability to sample from this transition function. So we'll start by first rewriting this equation as an expectation. So we move the sum over the future state as prime and the product with the probability into the expectation. So here we haven't done much yet. I mean, it's just the same equation. But what we're going to do next is to rewrite this expectation uh, or replace it by samples from this distribution. So that will give us an algorithm 
called tabular queue learning. So first, let's see how it works for a single state action pair. So imagine we have a state S and an action A. What we'll first do is to execute this action in the environment, which will be equivalent to sampling a future state S prime from this transition function. And then we'll look at our current estimate of the Q values at the current state and action, which is given by QK, and we just perform a simple table lookup. And we'll also consider a sample estimate, which we'll call the target value at the future state S prime. And this will be a sum of two terms, the first term being the immediate reward we get from this transition, and the second term would be the discounted version of the future value according to our current estimate. And we will take the maximum over all future actions we can take. And given those two estimates, we are going to incorporate them into a running average. So here we have a hyperparameter alpha that controls the relative weighting of the old and new estimate. So typically, we will let alpha be a relatively small value so that gradually we are moving our current estimate of the Q values closer and closer to the target estimates. Okay, so that's what we do for a single state and action pair. And now we're ready to look at the entire algorithm of tabular Q learning. So we're going to, analogously uh, to the Q value iteration, we're going to start with some initial estimate. And again, we can just set the initial values to be all zero. And we'll also get some initial state S. Then we'll have a very long loop until we're satisfied with the policy or until some predetermined time limit, where we first sample some action A uh, in response to the current state S. And this can be uh, from many strategies. Say we just randomly choose an action, and we'll also cover more about this later. And after choosing that action, we will execute that action and get back a future state S prime. And there are two cases. So first of all, if S prime is a terminal state, so this can either be a good scenario where, say, our task is to try to achieve some goal, say, successfully grasp some object, uh, or it can be a bad outcome, say, if you're walking along a cliff and suddenly you fall off the cliff, in which case you can no longer recover. And in either of those cases, there are no future uh, to, look up, to look anymore, and the target value will simply be just the immediate reward, which can either be a positive value to encourage it or a negative value to discourage you from doing that. And after we hit that kind of terminal state, we will reset the state of the environment to a new initial state so that we can restart from the beginning and have another trial. So otherwise, if S prime is not a terminal state, then we will use our previous calculation of the target value, which is the immediate reward plus the estimated future value. And then even this estimate of the target will incorporate both of those into an update to the next iteration of the Q value uh, according to the Q learning calculation. So finally, after doing the update, we're going to set the current state S to the future state S prime. So this is either the initial state if we have a reset or just the next state if we don't have a reset. So the reason for doing this is that now at the beginning of the next loop, when we sample the action or going to the current state, will now be dealing with the future state from the previous iteration. So that's really just an algorithmic convenience to perform this loop. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So here you can basically consider that there are two sampling process going on. One is that we will have some strategy to choose the action, which can be a sampling process. So the policy can be stochastic. And also, when we choose the next state, it can either be a deterministic or a stochastic transition. Uh, so that is conditioned on the current state and the action we choose, then we might uh, sample a next state. So those are two separate sampling processes. This point? Yeah, so basically here we will be uh, running some loop where we index by k. And so we'll start with some initial values. And what we're doing here is just to look up the current value of the Q values. So that's basically performing the lookup into our current table. And after that, we're basically setting the values at the next iteration at this state and action. And this action. 
And for all other states and actions, the value just stays the same. Yeah, so that's also a good question. Um, so there are a couple cases. One is that, um, so you, you have some prior knowledge about how long you can tolerate for it to like make no progress, and you just set that horizon by hand. Um, and also, pure learning can work even if you have an infinite horizon, which we'll show in a demo where, um, so just keep sampling actions and experience new states without ever hit, without ever hit this terminal state. So it's really problem specific. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a nice catch. So yeah, small type over here. So alpha is the learning rate. Uh, you can think of it as a learning rate. So it's basically a hyperparameter you use to control how much uh, weight you are giving to your target estimate and how much weight you are giving to your existing estimate. Yeah, so, yeah, so, th yeah, that's actually a good question. So, imagine that, sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, so the question is, why isn't alpha simply one? Um, so in general, we want alpha to be some value between zero and one, because let's say we have a stochastic transition. Uh, where we might get different next states conditioned on the current state and action. If we set alpha to be one, then each time we, our updated Q value will be only conditioned on a single future state. But in practice, we want it to be an average of all the possible future outcomes we might encounter. Yeah, yeah so the question is whether there's an implicit relation between the learning rate and the discount factor. Um, so that's a good question. I actually don't have a, I don't have a definite answer, um, but I think you are going to see that in practice, like if you change the discount factor, then the optimal learning rate for it to converge might also change. Yeah. Uh, so why, what is this line? Sorry, uh, what's the last part of the question? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is uh, why we can like do something after we are in this absorbing state? That question? Yeah, so basically here we have an underlying assumption that we can reset the environment. So we're assuming that we're dealing with some episodic problem where we run episode in the environment, and then we can repeat this process. So without that assumption, you're right. If we hit some terminal state, then we're doomed, so we'll just break. But typically, uh, we're not considering this case uh, in our current discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually, um, yeah, that's, so the question is, why are we doing this running average instead of the exact average? Um, so actually, later we're going to discuss that we can use a schedule for the learning rate uh, instead of exact value. And what we're going to see is that if you use the exact average, it actually corresponds to one of the learning rate schedule. Okay, so I think we should probably take other questions offline or through Piazza. So, Okay, so what I've just seen, uh, what I've just said is that we can have many different strategies for choosing this action A. So I've said something simple, which is uh, we can simply choose actions randomly, but there are also other strategies. So one, possible, one benefit of choosing actions randomly is that it ensures that you eventually cover every state and every action. However, when, uh, the ban, uh, what you might not favor is that um, in some cases, you'll hit the good state with a very low probability because most of the time you are choosing, you are just doing very bad actions, but eventually you want to learn about the Q values at the good states. So a strategy on the opposite end to the spectrum is to choose actions greedily 
according to your current estimate. So this might make sense at later stages of training where your current estimate of the Q values are already almost perfect. Then if you choose action greedily, then you are choosing good actions most of the time. However, during the initial phase of learning, this can lead you to uh, have insufficient exploration as some other regions in the state and action space. So imagine there are two strategies you can go about one problem. One strategy where you get lucky and you have good initial exploration and you have some idea about what the Q values are. So after you, up, after you update the Q values, you are more and more inclined to take those actions leading to this particular strategy. But imagine that this alternative strategy can actually lead you to a better outcome, but your initial value for the, for the Q values are actually bad. So if you only choose actions greedily, you will never explore this alternative strategy and you will miss the optimal policy in this problem. So it seems like neither of those two strategies are perfect. And what we really want is to trade off between exploring enough and also exploiting our current knowledge of the Q values. So this is actually a very challenging problem if you want to solve it in the general case. But there's a simple heuristic that often works sufficiently well, and that's called epsilon greedy. So in this strategy, we would choose a random action with probability epsilon, and otherwise, with probability one minus epsilon, we would choose the action greedily according to our current estimate. And typically, during the phase of learning, we will start with a large value of epsilon, so initially, we will be mostly exploring randomly. And as learning progresses, we will decrease this epsilon so that you are relying more and more on your current estimate of the Q values. Yeah, so, so I guess, uh, yeah, so the question is, why are we not choosing actions according to the current policy? So I guess one thing that's kind of implicit in the discussion so far is, first of all, what is the policy? Because what we're learning are the Q values. So eventually, the policy we're implicitly defining is the greedy policy according to the learned Q values. So we want to choose the action that maximizes the Q value at the current state. But if we just choose actions according to this policy, that would be the same as acting greedily, which might fall into the trap of under-exploring certain strategies that might be good. Um, yeah, so, so the question is, is there some like definite mechanism for choosing epsilon? So in general, it's very challenging to, to try to find the optimal scheme for choosing epsilon. But if you just want to show that Q learning converges or will eventually find a solution, then the requirements are actually very weak. And we will talk about that later. Maybe one more question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, instead of choosing random actions, can we, can we still have an alternative trade-off between acting greedily and completely random by having some kind of temperature and just choose the actions through a softmax function? So basically sampling each action uh, where the probability is proportional to the exponential of the Q values. Um, so that's definitely possible. So you might need a more clever schedule of how you adjust the temperature uh, so that some conditions which we will see later still holds. OK, so I guess let's move on for now. Yeah, sir. Oh, yeah. So is the question, so as we're doing those updates, we always throw away the data? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So the question is, as we experience those samples, can we use those to construct an estimate of what the transition function looks like? And given that, can we just use the methods we have already seen to solve for the optimal policy? So that is actually a complete topic, which is called model-based RL, where you're trying to construct an approximate model of the environment, and then to use uh, planning-based techniques to solve for that. So there will be a lecture tomorrow uh, on that specific topic. So all the methods we're going to cover today 
will be based on model-free methods, where you do not try to explicitly construct the transition function, and you just rely on an estimate uh, to improve your policy directly. Okay, so we'll need to take other questions offline. So yeah, so we have talked a lot about the tabular Q-learning method, and I'm sure some of you might be wondering, like, does this work at all? So there are two angles we can go about answering this question. And the first angle is from a theoretical point of view to try to say, are there some guarantees we can give to Q-learning? So here's the result, and it's very good news. So we can show that Q-learning will converge to the optimal policy. So this basically means that if you take the greedy policy of the convergent Q values, it will be an optimal policy. Even if during training, you act, you act suboptimally. And what I mean is you can really act very suboptimally, even if you choose every action randomly. So of course, there are still some caveats, uh, so some conditions under which this actually holds. Um, so here are the caveats. So first, you have to explore enough. So this basically rules out the case where you are only choosing actions greedily. Another condition is that you need to adjust the learning rate so that um, it is decreasing, and eventually you need to make it small enough. Because what can happen otherwise is to say, if you have a constant learning rate, and if your uh, transition function is stochastic, then your Q values can oscillate between some values and never converge. And finally, you can also not decrease it too quickly, otherwise you will converge, but you will converge to the wrong values. And I just want to have an additional comment that this strategy belongs to the general category of off policy learning methods. And the general idea here is that we're decoupling the strategy we use to collect samples, which we're training the Q function from. And also there's another strategy, which after training we're going to execute, which is a greedy policy according to the Q value. So although we're collecting samples according to a different policy or different strategy, we're essentially learning about a different policy. And that's why this is called off-policy learning. So those, those caveats are still kind of in loose terms, and we can put them into stricter technical requirements. So the first requirement, corresponding to the condition that we need to explore enough, is the statement that you need to visit all actions and states infinitely often. So in practice, this is a very loose constraint. And so even if you choose actions randomly, this is still satisfied. And alternatively, if you have some schedule like a softmax space aspiration, as long as you choose temperatures um, uh, appropriately so that this condition still holds, q is still guaranteed to converge. Another condition is on the schedule of which you update, update the learning rate. And there are two conditions. So here we'll denote the learning rate alpha t for a certain state s and an action a to be this quantity. And of course, in general, you can just have a uniform learning rate at a certain time step across all states and actions. And the condition is that over all times, the sum of all the learning rates should be infinite. So this means that your learning rate should not decrease too fast. And the second condition is that if you have the sum of the squares of all the learning rate, it should be finite. So this might seem like some very weird conditions, but you can satisfy it pretty easily by having the learning rate be proportional or inverse proportional to the time step. And to go back to an earlier question, if instead of considering the running average, you consider the exact average, where if you write out the running version of that, it basically corresponds to a running average where the alpha decays according to an inverse proportional rule. So actually, that exactly satisfies those two conditions. Yeah, so the question is, um, what's the difference between off-policy and on-policy methods? So we have seen that Q-learning is off-policy in the sense that you are using one policy to collect data, where this policy is implicitly defined through, say, for example, an absolute greedy action selection strategy. And the actual policy you try to learn or try to improve is an implicit policy which is defined by taking the argmax of the Q function where at a certain state you try to choose the action that maximizes your current estimated Q value. So what are some unpolicy methods? So unpolicy methods would be 
where you start with an initial policy and you collect samples according to this policy strictly. So this, so basically your intuition might tell you that this limits the policy to be stochastic. Otherwise, you'll have insufficient exploration. And after you collect samples from this policy, you will use those unpolicy samples to perform an update to the policy. So this will be captured, uh, sorry, those will be covered uh, in this afternoon's uh, lectures. Okay, um, one more question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what are the limitations of absolute greedy and other scenarios where you can take a very long time to find a good solution? The answer is definitely yes. And also, um, you can construct very simple uh, pathological cases where absolute greedy will take exponentially longer time to explore compared to an optimal algorithm, uh, which might have some other limitations. Um, yeah, so the problem of exploration is actually one of the central challenges in reinforcement learning. So I probably won't be able to answer that question in full detail in, in within late, this lecture. But we'll get to some of that aspect in later lect lectures and also maybe in some of the visionary lectures. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. And if you want to learn more about uh, the theoretical side, you can look up this paper. Um, so this is by Tommy Akola, Michael Jordan, and starting the scene uh, from 1994. So, so much. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, yeah, in general, like theory might not exactly match practice. And in general, they can be like very far apart. For example, people have known that absolute greedy can be bad in certain bad cases. But we know that absolute greedy works very well for many Atari games, uh, with, which can achieve superhuman performance. So I guess in practice, it's really a question of the specific problem you are dealing with. And as you gain better intuition, about reinforcement learning by, say, working through some of the lab exercises provided by this bootcamp, you should gain a better intuition about in which of those cases does a certain exploration strategy, um, will that suffice for this problem versus otherwise? Yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, so I guess the normal intuition is that um, we'll be considering some kind of um, square norm or some other norm to control the difference between our current Q value and the optimal Q value where the difference is something we want to control. And that's where all those learning rates come in. So actually, if you look at uh, some of the uh, convergence proofs of um, plane optimization with gradient descent, you also find this kind of learning rate conditions where it should either not decay too fast or too slow. And yeah, so I think you can find some of the references there. Uh, yeah, so the question is, does epsilon need to follow the same schedule? So it won't have such a strict condition. So as long as you satisfy this first condition, um, then you are fine. But of course, like if you choose the wrong schedule, it can take you a very long time to converge. So I guess that's one difference between theory and practice. So here we're only telling you if you have infinite time, then will it converge? But in practice, of course, we have finite time, so we need to do something more than just the theory that's shown here. Coming back to the example of the PhD versus the university. You only work with average. So for me, the usually, I don't care it's just about the average. So what's the usual way? 
Yeah, so I guess one distinctive feature of life is that there's no way to really reset. I mean, there, there are certain cases where you can like partially reset, but I guess if you consider the kind of reinforcement learning provi uh, performed by human race, it's really a collective learning practice where we're not just looking at the experience of yourself, you're also looking at the experience of all other human beings. And in some sense, that restricts your, restricts your algorithm to be inherently off policy because all the different humans have different uh, conditions and different, yeah, different initialization and whatever. So somehow you need to incorporate all those knowledge to improve your own strategy. So I guess that's like a very challenging version compared to what we're covering here, where you have the luxury to at least reset and to try out alternatives. But in practice, um, yeah, it might be a totally different story. So I guess one thing that might kind of answer that question partially is um, for some of the model-based method, where you can try to build up an estimate of how the world functions, then you can use such knowledge to approximate the plan. Um, so instead of actually trying out different options yourself, you can learn from others' knowledge about how the world might work, and that might give you some knowledge about whether you should do a PhD or go to industry. Okay, so unfortunately we might need to take other questions offline. So actually, yeah, so I want to show some demos, so that's enough for the series so far. So here we have the first demo, which is uh, the grid world example we have seen in the first lecture. So we'll actually get to look at how Q-learning works. So here I have a, have a grid world where uh, I initialize all the Q values at each of those states to zero. So the agent starts at the bottom left corner, which is denoted by the blue dot. And recall that if you hit the cell on the top right corner, you will get a reward of plus one. And if you hit a cell right below that, you'll get a reward of minus one. So there, this cell over here. So I'm going to start by controlling it to try to go to the good cases first. So after that, the Q value gets updated to 0.5. So what's happening here is that, I'm use, first of all, I'm using a learning rate of 0.5. So alpha here is 0.5. And also the discount factor is one. So there's no discount to make it simple. So after this very first episode where I reach the target, the Q value is updated to the old estimate, which is zero, plus the learning rate, which is 0.5, times the immediate reward we get, since it's a terminal state, which is one. So after that, the Q value gets updated to 0.5. And also notice that no other Q values gets updated because before we reach the target, all the current estimates are still zero. So as we go along those trajectories, all those Q values still remain zero. But now as we move along this trajectory for a few more times, we can see that along the trajectory, the earlier states also has their Q values updated. And as we do this more and more, we can effectively see that the re terminal reward gets back propagated over time to early and earlier time steps, and we will build up a better and better knowledge about the Q values along those states and those actions. But notice that the Q values at all other states and other actions are still zero. So we can also consider if we're at this, at this state, what happens if I go up instead of going right. So it, it turns out that the Q value at that state will also get updated. So what's going on here? So what happens is that if we're at this state and we go up, since we hit a wall, we basically are still remains at the current state. Current state. And when performing a Q value update, we'll look at the immediate reward, which is zero, since we're not at the target state yet. And we'll also look at the Q value at this new state that we just reached, which is the same as the current state. Then we will take the maximum of all actions we can take and we will choose the best Q value we can get. And in this case, the best action we can take is the action to go right, in which case we'll land at the target. And so we'll use the estimate Q value coming from that, which is 0.94 over here. And we'll, use, we'll, we'll multiply that by the current learning rate, which is 0.5. And that'll give us the new estimate of the Q value if we take the action of going up. So similarly, if you now explore the bad cases, and boom, we'll have a new Q value of minus 0.5.
And if we repeat this process for a little bit longer, we can see that we get better, better and better estimate of the Q values along those best scenarios. But notice that this bad values does not backpropagate over time like the good values. So the reason for that is because in the Q learning update, we have this mechanism of choosing among actions. And for those actions, we look at each of the estimated Q values. So although some of the actions lead to bad Q values, as long as there's some alternative action which can give us a better outcome that guards us from propagating those bad rewards back in time. So that's because inherently we're learning about the optimal strategy we can use in this game. So that's so much for this example. And let's look at another one. Um, yeah, so we need to discuss about that. So this is actually part of the uh, AI lectures in Berkeley. Uh, but you have access to the videos for this. And for this second example, you'll get to play with the environment uh, during lab one, which will be released this afternoon. Yeah, so here I'm performing one step of Q-learning after every time step. OK, so let's look at another demo where we have a planar robot. So unfortunately, I don't think I can zoom up, but hopefully you can see a robot over here. So basically, uh, here we have a state space consisting of two dimensions. The first one is the angle between the body, which is this box over here, and the first link. And we'll call this the arm angle. And the second state dimension is the angle between the first link and the second link. So we'll call that the hand angle. So here we're dealing with a continuous state space. So we cannot immediately apply uh, tabular Q-learning. But what we can do is we can discretize the state space. So in this particular example, we're discretizing the arm angle into nine bins and the hand angle into 16 bins. And what's showing on the left is the state value. So this is denoted by V star um, of each state. And a green color will correspond to a higher value. And the red color will correspond to a lower value. And on the right hand side, we're displaying the Q values at each state and taking each action. So we can see that within each cell, we have four values instead of just one. And here, the blue bars denote the currently estimated optimal action we can take in, within each of those states. Yeah, yeah, so the, so the blue one is their current state. Yeah. So basically, uh, we are seeing this uh, blue state navigating contiguously along the entire state space. And as it moves along, it updates the JSON Q values as the experience system. Uh, the reward, yeah, so the reward of the robot um, is the distance that you travel forward. So here the task is to try to make it move forward as quickly as possible. Yeah, so actually uh, one use of RL is to replace many of the trajectory planning approaches. Um, and it's especially good at dealing with cases where say the dynamics is very discontinuous. And then those RL methods can really do much better in some of the cases than trajectory optimization. OK, I probably also forgot to mention uh, the action space of the robot. So here the actions will be a Cartesian product between moving the angle of the arm either larger or smaller, and also moving the hand angle either larger or smaller. So there will be four actions in total. Uh, yeah, sorry, we probably need to take that question offline. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so I guess we're kind of running out of time, so I'll fast forward this for a while and just comment that as we fast forward for two million time steps, we now get this much better looking Q values. And so right now, we are still pretty much randomly exploring, but if we shrink the epsilon, we'll now see that robots can move forward with a much more consistent motion. <laughs> and you can also see that Within the state space, we're kind of looping through a very small region within the state space. And that is a very simple strategy that is actually performing. So you'll get to play more with this in your first lab. 
So just uh, watch out for that. Okay, so, so, so far we have covered tablet queue learning, which is a sampling-based approximation to queue value iteration. And we can also consider other algorithms, such as value iteration, and we can ask the question of whether we can approach this method with sampling-based approximation. So it turns out that there's a difficulty here, because instead of writing it as an ex expectation in the outermost level, we have a maximum over actions we can take. And in general, the problem is that we cannot just exchange the maximum with the expectation. So it's unclear how we can take samples through this maximum. So we'll hold on to that. And let's look at some other approaches. So for policy iteration, there are two steps. The first step is policy evaluation, where we iterate through this formula until convergence. And since the almost level, we have an expectation, we can use the same strategy to draw samples from this transition function instead of taking instead of taking expectation. And actually, this method is called temporal difference learning, which is used to compute the unpolicy value um, of a certain policy. And the second step, policy improvement, will have similar issues, where we need to take the argmax over all actions we can take. And so we'll also uh, skip this for now, but we'll talk about how we can work around this in later lectures. So the temporal difference is simply, yeah, so it might not be immediately clear, but if you look at the update uh, we performed in Q learning, one alternative way to write that is to have some term which is alpha times the difference between your current estimate and the new estimate. And that is considered like a difference. And since it's a difference between the current time step and also an estimate at a later time step, so that's where the temporal uh, term gets come from. Okay, so Yes, now I have four sampling-based approximations. So we've seen that discretization can sort of work for small uh, continuous spaces, but as soon as we move to more complicated problems, those discretization methods really doesn't scale. So we've seen that it sort of works for grid world, where the number of states is on the order of 10 to maybe 2, so we have a, at most a few hundred states. But for Tetris, this gets much worse, where the total number of states is somewhat around 10 to the 60. So that's more than the total number of atoms in this universe. And it's even worse for Atari. Either you use a RAM representation or a pixel representation. It's just um, beyond possible. And similarly for continuous environments, if we use a crude approximation where we have 10 bins for both of those dimensions, it's on the world of 100 states. But for a slightly more complicated robot with a few joints, and with the same discretization scheme, this number moves up to 10 to the 10, so it's about 10 billion states. So if you're at Google, you can probably do that, um, but for even more complicated robot like the humanoid, you now have the number of states on the order of 10 to the 100. So even Google won't be able to do it. So we need to do something more. And the central idea here, or the central problem with basic queue learning, is that we're, also, we're always using a table of queue values. And each time when we want to perform an update, or we want to consider what to do in a new state, we just look up this table. This requires the state to exactly match what you've seen during training or in your prior experience. But in practice, we never really encounter the same state twice. Just as the old saying goes, you never enter into the same river twice. And in practice, your robot or your game never really encounter the same state as soon as you get this kind of combinatorially rich behaviors. And to resolve this issue, what we need to do is to generalize. What we want to do is to learn from a small number of training examples and to generalize no, no, those knowledge to new states but similar states. So this has been a very fundamental idea in supervised learning, and it is at least equally, if not more important, in reinforced learning. So we're going to look at one version of this algorithm called approximate queue learning, where instead of a table, we'll represent the Q function as a parameterized version, uh, which we'll call Q theta as A. So instead of performing a table lookup, we'll compute this function uh, when given the state and action as input, and that'll be our current estimated Q value. So this can be a very simple form, such as a linear function, among some of the features we can define by hand. So say F0 up to Fn are the hand-designed feature functions, and the coefficients are theta 0 through theta n. So now the total number of parameters gets reduced to n plus 1. 
We can also consider using a much more richer form of representation, such as a complicated neural network. So what will be the learning rule for approximate Q learning? We'll still use the same definition of target values, except that instead of having the estimate be a table lookup, we'll use our current parameter value, theta k, to drive the computation of the target value. After we obtain the target value, we'll perform a gradient update on the theta with respect to a square loss between the currently estimated Q value of the current state and action and the target value. And we'll evaluate this gradient at the current theta value. So um, on surface, this seems kind of different from what we did before to tablet Q learning, but actually they're essentially the same thing. And in some sense, the tablet Q learning is a special case of approximate Q learning in the following sense. So imagine that we can define a very um, non-generalizing theta value, which is a vector, which is a matrix uh, with S rows and A number of columns. And here to compute the value of Q at a specific state and action, we're going to essentially perform a table lookup into theta. And so let's consider the gradient when we have this particular parameterization. So the gradient is with respect to this square loss, and we can replace it with our definition here. So we have the difference between theta SA and the target value at the future state. And if we evaluate the gradient with respect to the parameter value at this state and action, we're going to get just the difference between the theta value and the target. And if we plug this in, if we plug this into the gradient update, what we're going to get is, formula, is a formula like this. And if we rewrite this formula, we're going to get one minus alpha times the previous value of theta SA plus alpha times the new target value. And if you now com compare this to the tabular Q learning update, you can see that they're really the same thing with slightly different notations. So in practice, this can work quite well. And with some, uh, with some attempt at hand engineering the features, so here we can define 22 hand engineered features for a Tetris game, which is effectively compresses the representation of the Q function from 10 to the 60 parameters down to 22 parameters. And if you use an effective RL algorithm, you can achieve superhuman performance on this game. Yeah, so unfortunately I won't have time to get into that in detail in this lecture, but what you, but, so the bad news is in general, this is not guaranteed to converge, but in practice, uh, from an engineering standpoint, there are lots of uh, practical tricks you can play to make it behave more stable. And that will be also covered in later lectures. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, I think I need to go through all the slides. So I only have two remaining slides and we can, depending on time, decide whether to take more questions. So we, have, we can see that when the properly tuned with proper features, the approximate Q learning can perform pretty well. But the downside is that we still need, need to hand engineer those features. And that really brings us to the central topic of this bootcamp, which is deep reinforcement learning. Where instead of relying on those hand engineered features, we're going to use very powerful function approximations, just such as deep neural networks, to represent those Q values. And that enables us to map from very large state spaces, like from raw pixels, down to actions, with no hand engineering in between. And we're going to essentially use the same algorithm that we just covered with some more effective tricks to make it more stable. And the only difference is that instead of having, say, on, on the order of 10 parameters, we now have much more, say, on the order of 3 million parameters. So with that, we have now covered enough for you to get started on the first lab. So it will be released by the lab session this afternoon on Piazza, and it covers value iteration, policy iteration, which are algorithms from the first lecture, and also tabular key learning from this lecture, where you can play with the crawler yourself. Okay, so that's all I have for this lecture. <laughs>